one area in particular that I found fascinating about our first chat was we talked a bit about nitrites yeah. in processed meat, right? Because processed meat is very controversial. Some people believe it to be like the devil incarnate, and others will, you know, regularly use it for, a, for the valuable source of protein that it is, right? Yep. But one, I think, chemical that does seem to, um, that there seems to be, I guess, more agreement on than not is sodium nitrite, which is added as a preservative yep. in, in processed meats. And a lot of people tend to, like, avoid that as a compound. But you've argued you've published yep. um, papers suggesting that this isn't actually the dietary boogeyman that, that it's That's often right. made out to be. It is a cure. It's an actual cure. It's a, it's cure a curing meat. agent to me, <laughs> and it cures the human being of disease. The, okay, this is fascinating so, and, and highly controversial. Yeah. Well, let's go back historically. Again, yeah. there's a reason for the way things were done. If you go back thousands of years, long before refrigeration, when early humans were hunters and gatherers, they killed the buffalo, they killed the deer, there was no refrigeration, so they had to preserve the meat to get them through winter. What they found way back when, thousands of years ago, that they would preserve it with sea salt. And they thought that the salt was just reducing the moisture content of the meat and preventing spoilage and all that. Well, come to find out that the sea salt actually had nitrate and nitri some nitrite in it. It's a natural salt, potassium nitrate, what we call saltpeter today. And that led to the curing. So there, you, would, you would cure the meat. There would be bacteria that were, they were naturally on the meat. Then those bacteria would reduce nitrate to nitrite, and you would get nitric oxide that binds to the, uh, the, the hemoglobin of, or the myoglobin of muscle. And that mm -hmm. creates the nitrosyl uh, hemochroma pigment that causes the pink color and the red meat curing. So when it preserved the meat, it prevents food spoilage, it prevents uh, bacteria overgrowth, prevents uh, foodborne illnesses. So it's absolutely essential for ready-to-eat meats and any processed meats. In fact, for decades now, the meat industry is trying to figure out how do we get rid of nitrite because of the misinformation by the media. And you cannot live without it. I mean, if you took nitrite out of cured and processed meats, then... You would have more Americans dying from salmonella, E. coli, botulism than ever before. So then the question was, then fast forward to the 50s and 60s, and nutritional epidemiology came about, right? And nutritional epidemiologists take observations from populations of people and look at their incidence of certain diseases. So they found that people who eat um, uh, kind of a more process cured meats than others have a higher incidence of gastrointestinal cancers, whether it's colon cancer, stomach cancer. So these are observations and they're associations, but associations are not causation. So there's a series of steps you have to go through to establish causation. One of those is, one, there's an observation. And by the way, it's a very small increased risk. So relative risk is different than absolute risk, and it's a statistical um, kind of a deception. Can you give us an example a, of that, like where... So let's say if, you, if you've got a clinical trial and you say that in the control group that was eating cured meat, let's say 1,000 patients, and in that 1,000 patients, 998 people developed, uh, or two out of those 1,000 developed stomach cancer. And then in the control group, only one out of 1,000 developed stomach cancer. So the absolute risk is 0 0.001, right? But if you take the relative risk, there's a 100% increase in risk because <laughs> that group went from two that had cancer in the, in the cured meat and only one in the control. And it's 100% so it that makes headlines. It's 100% it makes headlines. Right. Otherwise, an absolute risk of 0 0.001, it's within the noise. And right. there's so many other confounding factors. That's the problem with nutritional epidemiology and, and relative risk and reporting this as relative risk. Hmm. It's a deception. Hmm. So you have to look at absolute risk. And actually what we look at is the number to treat. How many people would you need to treat or intervene to actually see a reduction in the disease process? So that's a whole other subject matter that people don't understand. They just read the headlines. And those are headline-grabbing numbers. But the next step in that was what's a biologically plausible mechanism to see that observation to establish causation? So in the 50s, it was recognized that nitrite can form nitrosamines. Nitrosamines can cause cancer. So that was their established bio biologically plausible mechanism. But then in the 1980s, it was recognized that the body actually produces nitrate and nitrite. This mm. was the first observation and really one of the first observations that led to the discovery of nitric oxide. Wow. So if nitrate and nitrite were 
cancerous carcinogens, why would the human body naturally produce them? So it starts shooting holes in their whole hypothesis. Mm. And then the other observation was from vegetarians, people eat a plant-based diet, have a 10 time less reduction in risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Hmm. So if nitrate and nitrite and cured and processed meats cause cancer, vegetarians would have a 10 time higher rate of cancer than meat eaters. In fact, we see pretty much the opposite. Wow. Because 85% of the nitrate and nitrite we get from our diet comes from green leafy vegetables. Vegetables, right. So 5% comes from cured and processed meat. The other 10% comes from swallowing our own saliva. Right. So you're saying that if this is true, then we would expect to see dramatically higher rates of these kinds of GI cancers in, in vegeta- vegans and vegetarians who That's are right. ingesting a lot more inorganic nitrate. nitrate. That's right. Super interesting. Yeah. So it goes back to the fact, this may be surprising, the media is not always honest with us, right? <laughs> Very <laughs> and <we're> getting, shocking. <laughs> and we're getting a lot of misinformation. <laughs> So this whole story of nitrate, nitrite, nitrosamines, and cancer has completely fallen apart over the past 30 years. And it was really the discovery of nitric oxide and that these compounds actually nitric oxide precursors. And in fact, I've argued since for the past 20 years that these are indispensable nutrients, hmm. that we need nitrate and nitrite. So I tell, and I've consulted for Kraft Oscar Mayer and tried to figure out ways how to do this. And I go, look, you shouldn't be running away and creating these nitrite-free bacon, nitrite-free hot dogs. You should lead with it, advertising it. I'm developing this compound as a drug. We're developing these as functional nutrition products. And in fact, we've measured this and we published this in 2009. Nitrite-free bacon has five times more nitrite than bacon with sodium nitrite added to it. Whoa. Where does it come from? The celery powder or whatever? Yeah, so here's, here's the game. To get a no-nitrite label, you just can't add sodium nitrite. So what do they do? They use celery salt, which is high in nitrate. Hmm. And then they put a starter culture of of a bacteria called staph carnosis on that broth, and the bacteria reduce the nitrate to nitrite. So it's the nitrite that comes from nitrate that cures the meat, but they didn't add nitrite directly, so it's no nitrite added meat. Wow. But yet, now you've got a problem with the variability of the bacterial reduction. You still have some bacteria present in that food, and the shelf life isn't as long. Hmm. So it's not a better product. It's a more expensive product, but it's certainly not a better product. So I tell people, save your money. Don't spend the extra $2 a pound or whatever it is now to buy no nitrite or organically cured or whatever they're calling it now. But so what is the process then by which these nitrites become nitrosamines in the body? Like don't, when you fry bacon that has sodium nitrite in it at high temperatures, I'm not a chemist, but like, isn't there some kind of reaction that converts these compounds to nitrosamines? Yeah, here's the chemistry. You've got to have a certain set of um, conditions or reactants present for this to occur. So there, and it's not nitrosamines in general. So it's only secondary amines, right? So this is a certain type of low molecular weight amine. So primary amines, uh, they typically rearrange to alcohols. They're non-reactive. Tertiary and quaternary amines, there's too much steric hindrance for the nitrite to react. So they don't worry about it. So the only thing we worry about are secondary amines because they're small, they're low molecular weight, and nitrite can react to form nitrosamines. Hmm. And then those nitrosamines, and there's only there's a handful of these that are known carcinogens and that are mutagenic and cause cancer. So I don't dispute the fact that nitrosamines are bad. So what we have to understand is, is there endogenous formation of nitrosamines in the food we eat? So, number one, you have to have nitrite. Number two, you have to have the presence of secondary amines, which there typically are none in meat products. I mean, you can add dimethylamine and form nitrosal dimethylamine, which is a, a huge liver carcinogen, but that's not naturally present. Hmm. The other thing, once they realized this chemistry, was that vitamin C and polyphenols and vitamin E are potent inhibitors of nitrosative chemistry. So even if you have a secondary amine around and you've got nitrite, if you've got a certain amount of ascorbic acid or vitamin E or polyphenols, it completely inhibits, 100% inhibits that reaction. Wow. So you don't get any nitrosamine formation. And I believe it was 1972, the Code of Federal Regulation changed to where any nitride-cured meat product, you had to add ascorbic acid hmm. to prevent any potential nitrosative chemistry. So now they use erythrobate. You'll see erythrobate on uh, bacon and hot dogs. And that's kind of the, we call it an accelerant because it accelerates the one electron reduction of nitrate to nit- or nitride to nitric oxide, which is the actual curing agent, and it prevents any nitrosative chemistry. 
So now there's no no cause whatsoever. Hmm. So you're getting efficient nitric oxide production. You're getting efficient curing. And really, there's no residual nitrite left in a cured meat product. It's the NO that's bound to the heme of myoglobin. In the meat muscle itself, there's hardly any residual nitrite. Wow. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.